very quick intro. Um, fantastic to see you all here. Thanks for coming out. I was a little bit worried because it was so windy and wet, but we've actually got a really great turnout here, um, which is fantastic. So um, the talk came about kind of randomly. I was speaking with the guys at BGW actually about doing their devil's talk, and they've been doing some sort of interesting stuff there. And then it came about that they said, oh, actually, we might have a really cool talk about shape up. Um, and I'd never heard of it before, and then was introduced to Lee and Eli, um, and here they are at Agile Perth, and really excited about this talk. For one, I do a lot in the Agile space, and I hadn't even come across Shape Up until it was mentioned to me, so it's pretty cutting edge. And also the guys at BGW are really experienced engineering teams, and obviously experimenting cool stuff, so they've come here to share it with us, which is really awesome, and yeah, really nice to see everyone um, be able to have an early early meet-up and, and see some friendly faces, so um, really looking forward to this. Just a little personal story about, I guess, Basecamp, where Shape Up came from, so that was a tool as a junior web dev, one of the first tools I kind of used, kind of Jura-style project management. And I remember being really blown away by his user experience and thought, oh, this is pretty cool. Um, also, the guy, one of the founders, David H. Hanson, I think his name is, invented Ruby on Rails whilst working at Basecamp. So, um, where Shape, uh, where Shape has come from is a real hotbed of innovation and some cool stuff. So, again, another reason why I'm really interested to learn more about it. So, um, without further ado, I'll hand over to Eli and Lee, and let's give them a welcome. Thanks, Will. Yeah. Um, so, uh, before we get started, we should do uh, our test. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I've been reading uh, notes. Um, a lot of people have asked us a lot of questions about how Shape Up works. So, bear with us. Yeah. Um, so this is also a story as much about Shape Up, Basecamp's way of delivering their products as it is um, our journey from a bit of a basket case with BGW. Some people, the former team members will remember what it was like in our team, to, we would say, a pretty high performing team. So um, we'll cover later up Shape Up as one of the four things that we did to change um, how it is for us in the um, Three hour talks of themselves, things that we just don't have time to talk about. Cool, so before we get stuck into it, this photo was staged, but it's actually quite reality between the two. We have a bit of margin, but it's pretty helpful. Um, I'm Eli, I've been at BGW for about almost three and a half years, exactly four weeks longer than this guy. Um, we knew each other before. I run the product team at, um, in our team. Three large business units within BGW and uh, run the product team for one of those. Uh, I've got a team of product management team of four and three product designers. Um, I consider myself a bit of a generalist, not T shaped, not W shaped. Um, and before that, 10 years in agency and consultancy in the design space and some government, state government work in New South Wales before that. Campbell, uh, for the context of this talk, um, it's not a software talk, but uh, contractor for 14 years, so quite a different way of working with um, stakeholders. So, uh, joining BGW was my first sort of full time engagement since 14 years earlier, I guess. Um, and yeah, team of we've got about 25 SOEs, engineers, testers on my side. So, um, Two years ago, uh, we were struggling, the, the Global Focus Pacific team, the business unit that we were working on. Um, we were largely doing Scrum, or like many people, a flavor of Scrum. Uh, we had three squads, um, mostly with uh, a domain focus, um, and then they would have their own independent ceremonies, Scrum ceremonies, happening. Um, each doing two week sprints. So that sort of framed what we were doing but it wasn't working so well. Yeah. So the, the structure kind of made sense. We were struggling 
to get to just to finish things. Um, work between the teams is often tangled. There's a lot of dependencies, left hand, right hand, you know what's going on. Uh, we were consistently changing our minds. This is, wasn't like you know, the deliberate pivots. This was, oh fuck, I don't know what to do next. I'm going to do this instead because that's less scary than that. Uh, so lots of context switching. We had stakeholders yelling at us. Um, Sarah and Lee, that. We had lots of people yelling at us. Uh, and no one to shield us. So, um, and we also had engineers just gradually finding a doorway to other opportunities. So, um, when we looked at the issues, there were, there were quite a few issues. Um, there was a high variability in skill sets and expectations. Um, this made estimates rather pointless. Um, it created discontent in the team and sometimes duties outperform seniors. Um, so you'd also see some team members pulling 60 hour weeks, which obviously isn't good, but that would be compounded with the discontent when, when other people wouldn't even make the 930 stand up. Um, the inability to finish things that Eli was just talking about was partly due to variability in skills, but it doesn't matter how good you are at coding, if halfway through doing something you get asked to change and work on something else. So that context switching is really hard and really expensive. A contributing factor to this pain was um, the inability to have a, a coherent strategy um, with buy-in from stakeholders. Uh, and this is really hard to do as a product owner when you're not quite sure what your role is. Um, are you there to manage a JIRA board, or are you there to be a proxy stakeholder, or are you there for product vision? And that those roles weren't really that clear. Um, and just to make it worse, uh, the safest thing we could do was to, um, to cling to Scrum. So we just scrummed harder. So we did uh, grooming sessions, estimates, velocities, planning, retros, and features. But um, Scrum, I don't think, really helps when your the characteristics of your work style is disorder, which was talked about a couple of weeks ago at the job group. So, what's our options? If Scrum wasn't working for us, waterfall? Well, we know waterfall is probably not a good option. Um, the evidence is pretty clear that uh, iterative methodologies far outperform uh, the long-range planning tools that waterfall. That waterfall use um, for modern software product development, which is what we're doing. We're doing product development. Um, Eli? Yeah. So at some point, and I don't actually remember the moment, we just sort of drifted from Scrum into Kanban. Uh, I refer to this period of time as Kanban Chaos. Um, one of our colleagues um, at the UW said, you're not mature enough to do Kanban, because Kanban is simple, um, and he was right. So around this time, Prof, some of us started reading Shape Up. It was actually a web version. We didn't actually have a um, it's still that web version. Um, and we um, we've started to, without get, we'll get into more detail, but the things that really stood out here was working towards outcomes. Um, and also this six week cycle of work, as opposed to two weeks script. Um, so it's a fixed time box in which to work towards the outcomes. So alongside our Kanban chaos, we tried a couple of projects with this six week uh, time box and um, we've got a few learnings there. But product leadership uh, wasn't on board. We felt like um, the agency and product leadership, they felt it was being taken away from. Things were just getting carried on like this for a couple of months. Um, and despite all this, we somehow were able to figure out which things we needed to work on now and next. So we knew what we needed to work on, we agreed about that, but we still weren't organized. Uh, and we still had engineers finding the door. So something had to change. So um, regardless of what we did do next, there were still some hundreds that we had to face up with. Um, to move out of disorder, some people had to start taking accountability. And um, uh, so myself, the engineering lead, um, I had to start being accountable for the quality of the software, the speed of delivery, and the operational reliability. And part
part of that uh, decision to do that, it seems obvious, but it was also stop standing over here and trying to do Eli's job. I had to come over here and just make sure my, my backyard was clean, okay? Um, which is hard to do when you can see a, a fire over there and you really want to go and fix that, but actually I had to focus on my thing. And then the next thing I had to do was um, provide a single architectural style because you can imagine creativity in a team, people are trying different things, and to sort of say, hey, crew, we're doing this one thing. And it actually doesn't matter what the style is, but doing one thing really helps. Then the next thing I could do from that with, with one architectural style was say, here are the six building blocks you need to do, learn and master, to be able to build this architectural style, which really gave the whole team focus, and uh, we sort of made mention of the problem mastery purpose later. Um, but allow them to be really good at something, which everyone wants to be, but it's hard when everyone's trying to be good at something different. We could all get together and be good at the same six things. Um, and most importantly, so that's the code stuff, and that's not really what we're here to talk today. Um, most importantly, uh, the product manager was going to be accountable for the outcomes of the product. Uh, this meant making sure that we knew what we're working on and why. So changes were made. Shape up was just one of the four key changes. So uh, the four important things was taking ownership. We stopped asking for ownership um, and we took it, but not an aggressive takeover kind of way. We just started presenting coherent plans that were just harder to deny than to accept. Like, hey, this is what we're gonna do, this is why, and this is how we're gonna do it, it's gonna be done by here. Management's like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But we find out what they wanted to say yes to first and then just give it to them, right? So then we started building that trust. Uh, we made it clear what the bar for behaviors were. So how people should behave in our team. Eli was a real flagship for that. We had other people like Bruce join the team as well, which just set the new bar for how we should act in the team. Um, and we canned the three squads. So we came together as one and that we just happened to have autonomous squad teams or, or project teams that would break away, but we all came together as one. So instead of having scrums and then scrum scrums and excluding people from things, everyone came together. And finally, the subject for today, we adopted Shaper. So in February 2020, we had some significant leadership changes in the team, including the taking over the product team. Um, and we started planning how we were going to get the whole team working in this six we needed to work on, we knew, like I said, we already knew what we needed to work on next, like the projects, um, so that was sort of solved. Um, but I was adamant that we needed the whole team to have a common start line. And we had a couple of, not disagreements, but question marks yeah. around whether or not that was important, and I, and I thought that really was important. Um, but that was a problem because we had lots of long tails and jagged edges, so you can see, I love this whiteboard. Um, at the top here, they were the things we were working on, and some of those things had finished a week ago, some of them would probably finish in a week or so, and then others I ate up with how long those things had been going for. Um, and so we're like, well, we know what we want to work on next. Here's the start line, how are we going to get to that start line? Um, so we had to make some hard decisions about what we we're going to stop working on. And to be honest, the teams working on those things, they were actually related to given permission to stop. It's like, we have to make a brutal decision here. We are, we are going to stop that thing, wrap that up as best as we can, and here's a start line. Everybody knew we needed to change, so here we go. Um, so we had a plan, we just needed to pick a start date. And then we knew we got a lot out there. <laughs> <laughs> In March 2020, we all went into lockdown and we are all doing great numbers on the street. And um, we decided to do it. So we got on the bike and we just did it anyway. It was frightening, but we made a very smart decision to commit to two cycles. So that we could fail halfway through the first cycle and we had an opportunity to improve in the next cycle. Um, so jumping ahead a little bit, um, at the end of the first two cycles, we took stock and reported back on how we'd gone and 
it was just a rough heuristic in the space of 14 weeks, so six weeks plus a two week pull down break and another six weeks. We didn't look to deliver as many comparable features as the previous 14 months, so roughly four times better. Yeah. In two cycles, it was, it was crazy. Yeah, so um, shape up might not be for everyone. Um, uh, Basecamp delivered shape up or the book as a way to deliver their own products, and it's uh, they, they're kind of sharing what they've done. It's a guideline. This is how we're working. It's not a manifesto. Um, they're not very dogmatic about the way they work. And for us, shape up was just a toolkit for getting shit done. Um, we've taken the bits that work for us. Uh, because we're a product development team, but we're also not a very, I don't know, they're trying to innovate heavily. A lot of the stuff we're trying to do is just, to be honest, there's not a lot of innovation in what we're doing. We, we know our direction that we need to go. Um, and so yeah, this might not be for you. In fact, even in BGW, not everyone's on board, so I think we can be honest with that. Um, we think we're doing it quite maturely, and we're very happy with it, hence why we're here today. Um, but change is scary, I and mean, why, why it, might not be for you is, I mean, sorry, it's, um, so what we're not going to talk about today is prioritization, which I think Eli does very well, stakeholder management, again, he does very well, something we've both worked on a lot, team health and growth, um, which is a, a, a week-long workshop by itself, and software architectures. So the bits we think really help us, working in six week cycles, that worked for us. Appetites over estimates, scopes, and hill charts, which is a cool tool, uh, and milestones of risk management. Now, milestones of risk management is not actually important. We think that's a really important customization for the act um, that has um, made this a success for us. Yeah. Great. So, um, so, so why six weeks? Um, well, planning is costly, right? Um, and doing that planning every two weeks can start eating into uh, efficiency. So there's a lot of overhead. When you look at all the ceremonies, like sprint planning, estimating retro showcases, uh, you have to get the timing right between those two week sessions. Um, this was all compounded by not being able to walk away from, so you get to the end, like Friday the second sprint, and there's still a little bit to go. If you bring that baggage over with you to the next sprint, but generally I've seen the practice scrum people do. Um, so what do we do the next sprint? We, we still have some of the ceremonies that may be familiar, so we still have planning sessions, uh, we still have retros, so we do bookend our six week cycles, but the other things we do um, in the middle of the, the session, so we have a two week grandstand, every two weeks there's a grandstand so we get to show stake on what we're doing. Um, we have on demand tech reviews, so we don't do a tech review at the very end, we don't do a tech review just at the start, we do the maybe every three days, if that's what that project demands. Um, and this serves, um, oh yeah, and we also have an all-hand stand-up every day. So we have 36 people, 27 in Perth, um, nine remote, and we get the whole thing done in 15 minutes, generally just 10 minutes. Um, and this works great because it keeps the team engaged. We all know what everyone's working on, which we find really healthy. Um, allows us to service any dependencies. Oh, Bruce, you're changing DNS stuff today. Well, I'm changing something that would affect that. We're on different projects, but that really helps us know because at some point things are shared. Um, it keeps the team accountable to each other uh, and also makes sure that no one goes dark because everyone can be like, hey, Bob just said the same thing for four days in a row, right? Um, and sometimes that can slip through the gaps if you're in scrum scrums. Um, so a lot of familiar ceremonies, and we, but we killed off some as well. Also, six weeks, long enough to finish something meaningful. So six weeks, I can get something done. You know, I work on projects where we can get something meaningful done in two weeks as well. That, that definitely can be done. Uh, but th this second quote I really like here is, it's short enough that everyone can feel the deadline looming from the start. And maybe you can get something a bit more valuable than that two week cycle. Um, but isn't this <coughs> just six week sprints? Isn't this just scrum? What were you guys talking about? Right? Uh, 
Well, we do have planning sessions at the start of the retro. We do have the semi-formal check-ins. But importantly, the six-week cycle allows us to deliver something meaningful, and Eli's already said it, put the bow on it. So one of our key things at the end of our six-week cycle, and that Eli really insists on and I back him up with, is that we're done. Not like, oh, is it done? Oh, it's not done, it's done, done. But there's, no one else talking about done, done. I was out there driving this. Um, but when you are done, that can be handed over to another team. Maybe next cycle, maybe in six months, maybe in two years. But there's docs there ready for it. It's got observability and monitoring. It's got an on-call policy. It's got run books. The whole thing's done. It's tested. It's deployed. Um, sometimes I see in, in um, scrum books, it's like, come on, but we have to get this to production. We're not aiming to get to production. We're aiming to, to, to produce value and operational viability. Okay, so that's quite different to getting, pumping something into production versus delivering value and it being operational viable. Uh, yeah, so also, it's not just six weeks. We have a two week cool down. I'm sure there'll be questions about this at the end. Two weeks where we're just not working on project work. It's time to clean up and refactor. Learning and development, which is a big part of our culture. We talked about team growth. Um, the product team that you get really busy for two weeks and prepare the next cycle. And we also get a chance all to celebrate together because there isn't half the team working on something critical and the other half of the team stomping off. Cool. So one of the core concepts in Shape Up, which is a bit of a brain dead that most people it's, uh, is appetite. So appetite is the amount of time and people within a cycle that we want to to solve and it's determined in the prioritization process. So the max, maximum appetite that we can have for a piece of work within a cycle is six weeks, that's the length of the cycle, and three engineers, which, um, because we think six, uh, three, three engineers is the optimal maximum for uh, doing the work without stepping on each other's toes. Sometimes we'll throw a fourth person in for a short period of time just to um, crush through a certain problem or there's a specific Generally, three is the six and three is the max. Um, the minimum appetite is one week plus one engineer. Uh, and that, that we might have a feeling that the effort is less than a week to do that, but we think if it's valuable enough to pull into a cycle, then that should have the space of at least one week <coughs> in the year. Um, so, and if it is, you know, that's only an hour or a day. It's like, well, we'll just do that out of band. That doesn't need to be pulled into a cycle. It's that simple, just do it. Um, so just without going into prioritization process too much, our appetite is determined by the value that we think will be created by solving the problem. So very much about the value that we think will be created. And we have a very low fidelity heuristic process for that that works for us. Mm -hmm. It's called jobs. That's a different, different, different talk. Um, and that allows us to determine pretty quickly whether something is six weeks and three engineers, or that's just one engineer in one week, or somewhere in between. Um, subject to different talk. But we use it consistently in all of So once the appetite is determined and the work is prioritized for a cycle, the teams that picks up that piece of work, which also includes a product manager, a tester, um, they know the time and muscle that they have to work on to solve the problem. And then they can start figuring out how to achieve the desired outcomes within that constraint. Um, we give them the project and we also give them the responsibility for doing it. Lee and I aren't necessarily hovering over them and telling them that you need to do it this way. We're waiting for a proposal. Here's a, here's a menu of options. We think this is the right thing to do first, but we have a plan B. So very much you handing them the responsibility in that time box and time to do the side. At no point have we asked for any estimates. <laughs> we might have an idea of the effort required to deliver on a, on a particular problem, but that's never a commitment. So what's more important to us, we have an empowered and capable team that we trust when we hand that work to them and we say, go and solve it. Um, 
and we know the rules around that is they have to um, show progress and ideally deliver iterative value in that six weeks. Quick note about stakeholders. This is not a talk about stakeholder management. <laughs> um, but um, obviously, talking about how we're working, we're going away for six weeks and we don't have estimates or fixed solutions here. It's like, how do you manage stakeholders from that conversation? Um, it was hard at first. So, um, a good example we had with a particular piece of work and, um, was we uh, got into a kickoff meeting with um, the stakeholders that is marketing related, and we said, so, we're dedicated six weeks to solving this problem, and let's talk about how we're going to get towards those outcomes, and the first thing is, well, 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 shouldn't we tell you our list of requirements first, and then you tell us how long that will take, and we said, well, that's how we tried to do it before, but I think we can agree it hasn't worked today, continue, but what if we tell you that within week two, we can probably give you the first outcome you get, and within week four, second outcome. At the end of the six weeks, you might not have the magical pony that you're, you want at some point, but you will have something that moves towards that outcome. Was, that was a really important one. It's like, oh, now we know how to talk to our stakeholders about how we're working. Is this um, so, uh, so now we're talking about um, the Northern Amplifiers. We've got this bit of work. Um, but we don't have requirements. So what we do have are scopes, and scopes, uh, a language, allows us to break down the work. So obviously we don't want to have this big project and it's too amorphous, we want to put our arms around it. Um, but we also want to define the language of the work. So language is really important. Eli drives this a lot with our team, making sure that we're using the right words that we're tight. Um, and that our language often mirrors the business language. So when we're talking, there's no translation layer. Um, it allows us to track progress very simply, which we'll cover soon, um, and allows us to identify delivery risks. Cool. So this is the chapter scopes in um, the book that I linked to the most when we were on the Quick read that. Um, so when a team starts a project, we haven't really broken down the work into tasks or done any estimates, as we talked about before. The focus today has been really on defining the outcomes value of the work and making sure the team that's working on it explicitly understands those things before we take a step to it. Uh, so, but at some point we have to actually figure out how we're going to get there. And we can't fully know what the work is required, but we probably know some tasks that need to be done to start. We've probably identified some uh, risks and uh, uncertainty areas that we need to pay attention to. So we start listing those tasks out. We have too much concern about how they hang together just yet. Um, but this is just the same as the back of the Jira task. So it's cute. Um, but it doesn't really tell us at a high level what the nature of the work is. And it's probably full of technical tasks and technical language. But as the team starts to write all these things down, they start to see relationships. And they can start to ring fence tasks into more meaningful chunks of work. And they can describe the purpose of those chunks clearly in plain language, as I said. Um, each scope may include front end and back ends to form a meaningful layer cake of um, functionality can be tested and completed rel relatively independently of each other and can be um, moved to done independently. So these are more outcomes or output. So as mentioned, the scopes of the language of the project. This is really important. So when we're communicating with the project team, or with the broader um, uh, product team, or when we're talking to our stakeholders in Sydney, Dublin, Manila, San Francisco, wherever, the language actually makes sense. So there's a lot of effort put into this area that pays off. So we can say we've nearly completed field of form, and then we're moving on to preset locations, <coughs> which I, I get what that means. It's not a list of tasks that I'm working through. We have a JIRA, like we, we JIRA like Chuck and Ben. So we, we know how to use JIRA. This is, this is a different part to um, how we work. They call the government with the JIRA, right? Yeah. Here's a link to the JIRA book, thanks. <laughs> um, so just a note going from task to scope. Um, routine maturity and familiarity with your domain is important. 
how you get the scopes a lot quicker than starting the, the, the quicker than the camera, than starting from here to get to here. Sometimes we'll walk into a kick rock and we know what's on the scopes just because we have the area. But it's important that we know that gets to that. So, um, and just like with um, something like, say, splitting epi epics, that's a concept we want to have you can split scopes so or you can merge them, whatever that's fine. Like. There's more than one way of doing this. So now we have scopes that we can put on the bottom of the head. Yeah, I'm sure. um, so this is one of the things in the shape up toolkit that we adopted really early and I do have a white ball of picture for this that I just couldn't find because it was like so cute. But before we went into lockdown and then we had to do everything remotely, so we put it on here and it's all here on champagne now too. <laughs> um, the hill chart is such a deceptively dumb tool. I mean look at it, it's really low fidelity. What does it mean? So hill chart helps to track progress or a lack of it. It helps us identify risks. It helps us keep track of our answer questions, <coughs> track of things that we've already set around the scope. It allows us to see where to apply a handbrake, where to apply a circuit breaker. It's also a quick bullshit test for a new and lead to go. I don't think so, man. Right? Try yeah. again. <laughs> Um, but any, at a glance, anybody on the team or our stake who's a stakeholder should be able to keep track of what's going on. And this might be just cutting off quickly. Um, this is what these autonomous squads are working on. Eli and I are sort of disengaged at the moment. We're bouncing between teams and looking over the fence. So this, these tools are for us to be able to peer in to see how the team's working. Does that make <coughs> sense? So this is generally something that Eli and I are constructing. It's something that um, Bob and Jane on the team might be producing them and going, like this, Eli? Like, we can say that the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool, tracking progress. So, let's say at our first project check-in, the team has decided to pick up field on form first. This is this color-coded one. Um, and they're figuring it out or deciding how they're going to solve this part of the Until they've figured it out, they don't really know how long it's going to take. This side of the hill, figuring it out, is slow, often harder. This side of the hill, fast and easy. So at the next checkout, we can see they've figured out the build on form pretty quickly, and now it's just a matter of mashing keyboards, how you describe it, and getting the work done through to testing, and then hopefully it's going to end up there. Because they've started, um, they've figured out how to do it, one of the other engineers has gone and Set locations and they're starting to try to figure out how to solve that problem. So, so what might be some of the artifacts that you have when you're at the top of the hill? Like you've got given things <laughs> sorted out, you've got you've got general architectural design that you've run past probably myself. Yeah. Um, so this you really do just have to mash the keys. This is just coding you could, you could probably just hand that over to somebody else if we have that common bar, right? So yeah. Where we we have that documentation and we know the approaches and we, we said We've solved this by this, okay, uh, I'm just so interested because he's not here. Can you just get that done? Yeah. Um, so at the next check-in, we can see the building form is done and tested as a piece of what you are over here. Um, according to, more or less according to plan, the engineering worked on the fact, the work moved on to picking up migrated events. The preset locations hasn't really moved Spidey sense teamwork. That's how we see tracking progress. We can see how quickly some other things have moved. This one is just not moving very quickly. So let's just zoom out a little bit. So there's actually a few other things on our field chart, what we call our board. Um, so here we have identifying this. So we call them dragons. Dragons to the slave. Shape up calls them rabbit holes. Um, the team is called out dirty data as a dragon. Um, we could create a shiny new target state for this solution, but we know there's some dirty data to be migrated. We're just not sure of its scale. We haven't qualified or quantified it, so it's still a big unknown for us until we actually slay that dragon. We're not going to be comfortable about that then. Another tool here, keeping track of unanswered questions. We've got a question here that we've just documented. We're going to have to, Beck's going to have to go on and find out about address format. Um, we just need to know that because
because we need that to figure out preset locations. Keeping stuff out of scope. So we, need to, we decided to keep non US addresses out of here. So we don't have to worry about New Zealand's weird address formats and they don't care about postcode. Let's stop talking about that, it's out of scope. And we'll just keep it there for the whole project. So when you come here and look at it, we'll hire that's out of scope. Stakeholder will hire that's out of scope. It's not angry, it's just there. It's out of scope. Find the handle. So what it sounds like, we failed the project early rather than at the 11th hour. Let's say we are at the next check-in and preset locations hasn't moved. Um, and I've discussed it with the team, we know there is too much to actually solve within this, the time um, box that we have for this cycle. This will break the project. And so we use just this, this visual tool to identify there's a problem here and we decide we're going to go forward or backwards. In this case, we applied the handbrake and said, we're actually going to stop this project because it's going to fail. We, we're trying to fail. Our target is to fail the project within the first three weeks, not in week five or six, within the first three weeks. Uh, we've done this a couple of times. Once we've committed six weeks and two engineers to solve a rewrite of one of our core systems, and in week one, we've gone, nope, this is not going to happen. Either put you on some other project that needs help. Circuit breaker. So this one's a bit different. Let's say we didn't apply the handbrake and we decided to continue the project. We made a little bit of progress um, and we got display on this side of the board. That was pretty straightforward. And migrate events is coming along. There's a dependency on migrate events uh, with preset locations. We just can't, we just don't seem to get, get those over. The engineers come to us and say, I think we just need, you know, about another week or two. Can we work into our cool down period? So this is after the six week of the cycle, we have our cool down period. And we're pretty confident we're going to get it. And we're like, this has to be our first cycle. We're like, hmm. Do they say anything here? Oh, okay. So, if everything at this point is on the top of the hill or over the hill, you can go, yeah, we figured it out. We can we can more accurately predict how much time is required. Have a couple more days, that's fine. Good, thanks. But this stuff's on the left side, they're still figuring out, they have no idea how long it's left to go. And that's when you use this tool and you say, nope, we're gonna fail the project at the eleventh hour, it's the circuit breaker. Now why? Because you can't work on another thing if you don't stop working on this thing. And so what we would do here is, those things are still going up the hill, stop working on those. Get this thing to the bottom of the hill. We're more interested in the number of things that get to here than the number of things that get up and running. It's about completion. Yeah. And not necessarily completing everything, that's best, but having things completed is our priority. Not just starting. So we're also actually really fortunate to run into this problem in our first cycle. Added just a new level of discipline to the team as well. And it's like, oh shit, I understand what's at stake now with the timing of my um, accountability, raising concerns, and things like this. It really changed the game a little bit. Okay, so we talked about scopes, um, and this is our sort of thing that we've added on top for Shape Up. Um, but it's brutal, right? Failing a project early, but I think that involves a lot of discipline. Um, or at the 11 hour, we're not failing projects so much, we're just saying don't start that stuff. Can that, we'll, we'll take what we, we want from here. Um, side note, I found that people will be creative. Um, and if you constrain them and don't give them an avenue to be creative, they will find a way to be creative. Um, often in unusual and very unhelpful ways, right? Bruce had his desk, um, Christmas wrapped. <laughs> 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 Um, so, what we want to do is harness some of this creativity. So milestones um, are significant business outcomes. So we talk about scopes, business can understand scopes, but we uh, maybe can't just get a, a business outcome from fields on, uh, fields on form. 
maybe we need to have uh, uh, formal field and migrate events together gives us something, and that might be, I'm making up some stuff here, marketing consent. That's the actual outcome that the business was looking for. We need this thing to get marketing consent. We allow ourselves to group those together, and sometimes you might have one scope that ties into a milestone. Generally, it's more than one. Um, but here we can see that formal field micro event drives into marketing and consent, but preset locations is first. This sort of visually tells that something's not quite right here. So very quickly, I can say, well, hang on, shouldn't they be around the other way? So instead of preset forms, actually preset locations just gives us a really nice experience, but that's not the key thing that's gonna drive the business, that's the upgrade. So we move these things around. Um, and what this allows us to do is avoid this 11th hour failure. Because if we started with preset locations, we'd have this really nice UX and no business value. So that's, a, that's not the right way around. So, um, you, is this familiar to many people here? Um, so we talk about the, I don't want to do this and then have nothing on one, two, three, four. That makes sense. And then just propose this. The problem with this is, that one's okay, I can just stick a stick on it, fine. But that's a full rewrite, and another full rewrite, and another full rewrite. So we're tra actually trying to avoid the car analogy with what we're doing. So instead of that, it's almost a hybrid of the two of them. Um, so instead of the car analogy, I use the cake analogy. Imagine I've got, I'm, I'm bringing a birthday cake in for Eli. Happy birthday, Eli. I'm not a very good um, uh, uh, baker. So I'm gonna have a crack at baking a cake. Now, if I turn up to work with that cake, it's a cake. Eli's gonna go, oh, that's a sweet thought. Thank you very much. And a little bit of the cake and stand up and it'll be great, right? but it's just not a very good cake. But I've met my outcome, make friend cake, right? This is arguably a better cake, right? I, it's, but it's incremental. But if I can't get to there, I just stop when I get to the first layer and go, but I can keep in, um, making incremental improvements here. And at any point along this journey, I can stop, right? It's getting better, it's getting better. And now you're showing off, right? So, um, <laughs> uh, the point here is that what we're trying to do is come up with creative ways to unveil. So, and what we do with our um, milestones by rejigging these things, joining scopes up, try and change the way that we're thinking about it as opposed to features and requirements, it's outcomes and business value. How can I hit this business value in two weeks? But I've got six weeks, boss. I want you to think about how you can get it done in two weeks. And now we're triggering some creative behaviors. So we're going to see some good behaviors from our developers, our testers, our product people. Um, Kevin Brown, who worked with us, would also flex his heart. He'd go, what about one week? What about in three days? And it's really funny, because they, they, they know that we do this to the engineers. And like, yeah. I was like, no, but seriously, how can you get this done in three days? It can't be done. It's like, what about, oh yeah, actually, you could just, hang on, no, no, don't tell me, leave. No, I'll disappear and I'll come back. We've actually got an idea. We're going to hack this little thing up. It's going to pop up and just show the head of marketing this thing only if he logs in because we're going to archive something and check a cookie of Steve Lawrence. I was like, cool, you just de risk this thing. Steve can now see it in prod, right? Good. And um, then we're going to change that to an AB test script. But again, we're going to archive all of those things. Cool. Then we're going to move that back into a database. Cool. Now you're talking here. Then we're going to put a back end on it so that we can um, automate this and, and change who can and can't see this pop up. Now we're talking, so we've done the cake thing and we're not throwing things away each time. So that, that allows us to think of milestones and these milestones often are business outcomes. So, what happened? So, like we said, something had to change. We took a leap of faith, we adopted the shape up style uh, of working, fundamentally changing the way that we prioritise and organise and deliver uh, the work that we do. We've changed now. 18 months later, we're currently planning our 10th cycle, which is crazy. It's actually 10 and a half months at this point. Um, team health is great. Uh, people aren't leaving. A couple of people have left. And that's okay. That, that's, that's normal and healthy. Um, and the business appears to be very happy. And people are coming to us for advice and tips. They won't listen to us in a month, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good 
So how are we going to time that? Um, here you go, and K maybe um, just a, a bit longer, and then we we'll go to some questions. Yep. Yeah. Cool. So again, is this is this not, might not be for you. Yeah, yeah. It it does require a pretty highly engaged workforce. Like I said, we're looking for creative people. You're going to need creativity backed by skills. So you're going to need to be good at your job as a designer, as a product owner, product manager, or a, an engineer. So you're going to have to have that confidence to say, well, we can do it this way, and I've got the skills to help you there. Um, it's also going to require a lot of bureaucracy. If you need to change advisory board somewhere, this probably is a good one for you. Um, and it also requires higher autonomy. So Eli and I move more into coaches and mentor roles. And it's like, we trust you guys, go for it, we trust and verify, bring us back those menus, give us options. We've thought about this, we're gonna do this one, not these two because of these reasons. Good job, go for it. Right? Um, and that, that grew through to 15 now as well, doesn't it? Um, so I'm just gonna quickly scan through some things, but we're kind of wrapped up now. Um, but hopefully a lot of people are going, isn't this Scrum? Very quickly, what's the same with the things that we're doing in Scrum. Embracing variability, mm -hmm. reversing decisions, balancing upfront work and just the time work, um, thinking about technical debt versus uh, regrettable or reckless debt, validated learning, time boxes, one week sprints versus two week sprints versus um, cycles, we're limiting our work in progress, that seems to be constant across all agile methodologies, incremental progress, building quality and, and self organizing things. The same. We're, we're probably all doing that if we're in this group. So what's different? And I'm sort of taking a liberty here. This is Scrum in practice, maybe not Scrum in the book, but this is what I've seen <coughs> in Perth and Auckland, the places I've worked. Scrum tends to be, I find, more about being a bit slightly more dogmatic. There's lots of rules. You're not doing it properly. You need to do this ceremony. This, where's this role? Where's this hat? Um, whereas Shake Up's just got set guidelines. It's like, this is how we did it. Do what you like. Um, uh, Scrum says it's goal focused, but I tend to find it's process focused. Again, talking about roles and rules and things like that. Whereas shape up very much, or the way we're doing it, is all our outcomes. If you don't want to do the shape up bit, fine. Just get me lower LTV, uh, higher LTV, lower CPA. But you figure it out. See six weeks. Um, so yeah, we're not talking about requirements, product backlogs. That's a super interesting thing. Unimodal version of work. So you're always in a sprint, right? With Scrum, you're always in a sprint. We got a bimodal. You're in this highly focused zone for six weeks, which can be quite exhausting, but you get there and there's a really high sense of achievement at the end, and then we really do cool down, just like you would do at sport or training and things like that. And this is our growth phase, okay? So we have personal growth phases. Um, and in practice, I, I find that Scrum tends to favor consultancies. Being a contractor consultant for a long time, it was great. We walk in, we go, mm, four sprints, bang, 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 see you later. Because I never had to maintain this thing in production, right? I'm in a mouthpiece. Whereas <laughs> when you've got six weeks and you have to put a bow on something, Bruce here's our head of SRE, he's going to walk over and go, what's your logging strategy? When that <laughs> thing can't connect to the network or when the database is down, then what? Uh, it's like, you can't start the next thing on the hill until we've got this part solved, right? You've got to the top of the hill, re let me review that for you. So I find that we have a far better live ops system now because we've got that chance to cool down and that cool down allows us to learn more about how to do things better. Um, also it gives us time just to plant and weed the garden as I say. So weeds will grow automatically, the JDM will expire. It's version 17 came out this week. Who's upgrading that mid spring? Probably no one, right? Um, and some other things. Um, but happy to talk about this, but one of the things that we don't do estimates, so there's no velocity. There's no planning poker. It's a whole thing you don't have to think about anymore. Um, but otherwise, that end. Yeah. So um, thank you guys. That was really, really awesome. Um, great to see such a big crowd here. Um, I was going to say, if you guys are okay, uh, hang around for a little while for some questions. I'm also mindful this morning, so if you need to be somewhere, it's fine. Go, grab some food. If you want to hang around with these guys who finally donated their time, then stay for a while and yeah. we'll have some questions. We'll be here for another half hour.
So interesting. So we talked about marketing, not picking a but as an example. We're like, what would you like? And they're like, right, we want bup, 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 bup. Uh, good. You want a unicorn? Fine. Um, how about a pony to start with, or something like that? Um, what's your number one thing? If I could just fix one thing for you, and often they're like, oh, I'd love to have that. Like, so you just just stop I'll giving them this like list. That's yeah. probably some of the most important. So thing. Help, helping them come up with that, and then often. We have to be adults and go back to them and go, hang on, how do you get measured? How do you know you're doing a good job? Because, Matt, all I need to do is lower cost for acquisition. Cool, all right, well, what's the one thing you need to do? I need more blue on the screen. How's that going to lower cost for acquisition? Oh, it's not. I just love blue. Right, why don't we just, uh, that's the thing that's going to help you look good to your boss. Why don't we just do that? Oh, yeah, okay. Right, guys, solve that. And it's, would you be happy if in six weeks you had that? Yeah, I'll leave you alone for three months. Good. And then we can turn around to the customer service team and do the same thing again. So generally, when we told them, you can have something in six weeks, what would it be? Um, they're, they're happy. As opposed to saying, here's everything, because I have to ask for everything, because I know I'm getting asked. Yeah. They, get, they get more things more frequently, yeah. rather than the big thing they never get because it's too big. And it's often what they needed, not what they wanted. You mentioned uh, you had that the week's cool down for like uh, refractors and everything. Have you ever had like, you know, times where like, two weeks weren't enough? Uh, well, could we time box everything so we're trying to get that creativity. So um, what can we do? And so uh, last cycle, Bruce and I said like, here are all the things we're going to do. do, 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 do. And we're going to pretty brutal. The guys have just come off six weeks. Yeah. And Isn't we're now giving another sprint. Yeah, now we're just giving another project. Yeah. So we put some learning and development in there. So we had a, a workshop, half day workshop for the second week. Uh, and then we're like, you know what, those last two things, we'd love them done, but we're just going to scrap them. So same as what Elon of State Titles would do, we're not going to upgrade to Java 17 this time. There's actually no real benefit except for just house cleaning. There's no the security patches that we need in here. We'll just have Java 11 this time, but we will upgrade all the hotel things. And we're going to change the maiden to Gradle because of reasons. And so that happened. And also we have this idea of custodians. So our more senior people on the team will own an area of the garden, of the code base. And so they'll say, you know what, in my cool garden, I'm going to choose to work on these things here. So, um, so conferences, celebrating, doing some things, but also it's not a free for all for the two weeks. Someone will say, hey, I would like to, the wallet's just not performing, I'd really like to do some analysis on that. Okay, cool, what do you want to trade? I don't really want to go into chaos engineering. Of course, sweet, you do that. So, so the, the two week thing is about, or well, the time boxing is about creating uh, space for creativity to solve the right things and prioritize. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and there'll be another one in six weeks. I find this period really frustrating because I can't believe it. <laughs> 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 and that's, but it allows 
much has to go faster. So Eli knows that not much. Some things get done. We, we don't we don't go dark to all these things getting done. But um, um, he knows that when we do this, we go faster the next cycle. And I, I would say pretty much every cycle, we go a little bit faster than the previous cycle. And we also know there's business as usual stuff, which we haven't talked about. There is stuff that just to keep the lights on. And we're always tweaking how we fit that in. But I think it's everybody um, takes on a tiny bit of that responsibility over a longer period of time. It's not like Jonesy over there is just going to work on the shit stuff in six yeah. weeks. It's like, no, no, you're going to keep, you just have to look at some stuff for one day and then we're going to get you know, Tristan to put stuff on another day. Yeah. But other than that, that's your minor context switch. Yeah, can you just check, uh, clarify that the frequency or the cadence around check-ins and also what happens if the team does have to pivot because you've applied the handbrake? So um, fairly autonomous as to how often they check in. There's, there's a rule of thumb, once a week there needs to be a scheduled check-in where Lee or I can walk in and look at the head and go, cool, carry on. Um, they can catch up every day, they can have their own little stand up if they want. Um, that's not dictated, but once a week is the sort of healthy check-in period. Uh, what was the other part? If you have to apply the handbrake, how does the team pivot? How do you reprioritize that, what the team does? So when we plan and prioritize our cycle, and here's all the things we want to work on, we kind of have a priority order, priority one, priority two, it gets a bit fuzzy towards the end. We go, if something had to drop because something else unforeseen came along, we know these two projects, we're not going to drop those because those things need to and so we reduce the context switching around there. So if there's not within that handbrake an ability to pivot with, towards, towards the same outcome but with a different solution, and we say, you know, we're just going to can this project and we can move you guys on to help out on other projects. It depends. But we, we know we have options because we have prioritised the, the big work and there is plenty to do it. And that really helps having when someone's on the P1 or priority one project, they're like, I can just, I know I'm going to be good on this, I'm just working. And then things get a little bit tough, like you like, things get tough and you want to swing someone in. But if you're on the P4 project, you're like, right, I, I'm i sort of bracing myself for like, oh yeah, can you just help out with this thing? So I think that actually allows people to prepare themselves mentally, but also if you've been on P4, three times in a row, it's probably time that they switch and say, hey, I'm going to give you a high visibility project as well. Yeah. Um, just wondering, in practice, how much do you follow from chapter two right, regarding kind of the um, project pitches, the betting process, all that kind of stuff? I saw like on the slides there was one point that kind of said it was part of Shape Up, but you yep. didn't talk about it much. And generally, from, I don't know, from what I sort of understand, it's like, it seems to have less value than it did. Like chapter one and chapter three in the book, it seems it's like seemingly a lot of what you talked about yeah. and really, really helped. But the, the bit in the middle there, I'm just kind of wondering how much you apply kind of yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's a, it's a talk in itself. But yeah. um, we don't, so Shape Up talks a lot about the, um, there's a lot of lead time on some of those pictures, where there's quite a bit of pre work done, even though they keep them low fidelity. Um, quite a bit of pre work done, but as, as Lee mentioned, um, you've got too many Lees, <laughs> they're spelled differently. <laughs> um, so a lot of the things that we're working on have been solved elsewhere, so we don't have to do as much lead time as much. It's getting harder now as we've gotten through a lot of our challenges. We're starting to get more interesting problems to solve that require more lead time, but we don't require the same amount of lead time that they talk about in shape. Um, what we, we still have is this one pager, which you can read in here, and we talk about what's the what's the current state problem to be solved, um, what's the value of solving that, what's our hypothesis, does it tick off many of our um, strategic objectives and key results, and do you have any solution ideas, asterisks, do you use the right to find different ways to solve problems? Um, that's the minimum that we ask for, and then uh, the pitch season. We will then take a look at those things and see um, how they fit across different themes of work. So we're a game company, so um, do we have some game stuff that we want to do here? Do we have some stuff around customer journey, some operational back office tools, data, um, things like that. So we 
already have a kind of a, a place to land a lot of these ideas that come in, and then we'll sort of go, we'll sort of go back in that area that we can put the link up and so We don't have roadmaps as, as much as we just have an idea in our head. But that helps us um, guide us into towards what we want to pick up. And we look for new stuff, and we try not to have everything as priority number one, because that's really stressful. Um, so we try to get that right balance. But we don't follow that exact process. We have a scoring process that we talk about the world's But it's very, it's definitely driven by cost shape, right? Yeah. And, and also, I think one of the key things they talk about is um, if the pitch fails, there's only so much we can do, and we, we always get about three times as many pitches as we can do work. Um, Eli doesn't carry that baggage around with him like a backlog. He's like, sorry, Levin, make it this time. See you in eight weeks or six weeks or whatever. Um, so yeah. anyone doesn't have a backlog. Yeah, I don't have no a backlog. Grooming. Like, cool. How liberating is that? And now what we've found is some people are like, nah, it's worth a try. <laughs> and then they throw the pitch on the floor and you're like, well, that's why I didn't make it in. It's a shit idea, right? But if it's good, then they can say, well, guys, but, but it's really important to the CFO. You don't write that anywhere on the pitch, mate. Oh, this will make a key driver for blah, blah, blah. Put that on, and what you've not done is articulated well enough how this is important. So then they can work with us, and that's a much better relationship than sit with me and write some Moscow requirements document. It's like, that's not a healthy relationship, because that's really forcing them into learning something they don't care about their marketing. Does that answer the question? Yeah. I think we've got time for one more, then we might need to start reorganizing this space back. Cool. Uh, yeah. Good question. Um, with all the frameworks that are around, um, how did you guys come by shape up? And the second question quickly is uh, curious how you might have pitched it um, when you first discovered it. Yeah. That's two questions. <laughs> <laughs> the first one's kind of easy. I guess it just came around to our CTO was chatting on about it. I think Sarah, you were one of the first people who came across it. I'd heard about it through the trucks from some other design communities. Oh, cool, what's this? And it was online, it was so accessible. You didn't have to order the book and wait for it to turn up. It's like, oh, cool. And in terms of pitching, um, it was me, Lee, a couple of others in the team where we, 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 we didn't have to pitch it to anybody outside our team. Yeah. Because you know, like, in software engineering, um, you're supposed to decide how to do the delivery. It's interesting. This was more product shaping how we did our work than it was engineering saying this is how we're going to deliver all the features you want to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so but we, not too much argy bargy, but we, we got to decide. We took ownership. Yeah. Um, and it's not going to work for everybody because you know, it's hard. And one of the challenges in any organization with multiple teams is why aren't you all working the same way because I would like you know, consistency? But we were in such a position where we had to change something that was really fortunate. Also, also having, having our boss um, share with us for anything that might have been pleasant to him. Well, thank you very much, Thanks, everyone. everyone. Thank you.